Welcome to Menopause Morph, your time to change. We're here to help you thrive through your menopause, bringing you experts in many fields to help you from perimenopause to menopause and beyond to become the strong, vibrant woman nature intended you to be. Hosted by Pauline McCarthy of the Pearls of Pauline, pearls of wisdom, compassion, and joy. Hello, welcome to this week's Menopause Morph, your time to change. Today we have a lovely lady from the USA. Her name is Annette Hortenstein. Annette is the co-founder of Food Sensitivity Solutions, your number one source for food sensitivity testing, education and support. Annette leverages her background in nutrition and food science to help her clients discover the taste of good health. Annette completed her BS in nutrition. BS, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, a lot of BS, right? Really BS, you know. <laughs> so anyway, she, she's not really a BS person, you know. But she, Annette completed her BS in nutrition from Pennsylvania State University and completed her dietic internship at Texas A&M University with clinical rotations completed at Scott and White Memorial Hospital and the Olin E. Teague Veterans Medical Center. She also holds a Master in Food Science and Technology from Texas A&M University. Annette is a sought-after speaker. She has presented at the Society of Sensory Professionals, various academies of nutrition and dietics affiliates or organizations. Her publications appear in leading professional journals such as Appetite, Food Quality and Preference, and the Journal of Sensory Studies. Annette is also the host of the Food Sommelier podcast. Welcome, Annette. Thank you, Pauline. It's such a pleasure to be on the show and speak with someone from Iceland. That's exotic to me. It's the best place to be when you're having a hot flush, believe me. (laughs) (laughs) So, Annette, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into this food sensitivity thing? Like, what drove you in that direction? Sure. Well, I guess it started out when I was younger. Um, Growing up, I always loved food and cooking. And unfortunately, both of my parents were obese. Um, you know, they still struggle today, but that made me realize how much food affects your health and health affects your entire well-being. So I got really interested in nutrition as a field. And also, in addition to studying nutrition in school, I was a uh, food science major at Texas A&M. And I specialized in sensory science, which is a fancy way of saying professional taste tester which is why I call myself the food sommelier, because I can describe foods, hopefully healthy foods, like a glass of fine wine. Mm -hmm. So why I'm interested in food sensitivity testing, it kind of takes the best of both worlds. So as a dietitian, we're promoting healthy foods, but a lot of times when people have food sensitivities, they have to go on a very restrictive diet. That diet is called an elimination type diet. Mm -hmm. So they have to eat very few foods um, to figure out which foods are making them sick. So they get a very um, strict diet of just a few foods. And what I like to do is allow people to fully appreciate those few foods that they can eat so it helps them to better stick to that diet. So it's kind of taking the best of my background and applying it that way. Okay, great. And do you have a... a Any menopausal story for us? Oh, yes. I'm 43. I just turned 43 a couple weeks ago. Uh And um, gosh, it's Friday morning, wild and crazy. I'm going to go on air and talk about my breast tenderness. This is something I've never (laughs) done before. Oh, don't worry. It's just just between you and me. Nobody else is listening. (laughs) Yeah, you you and me and like 20,000 other people, right, Pauline? (laughs) But hopefully only ladies are listening. But About three years ago, when I turned 40, um, my cycle seemed to change. And about two or three days before I started menstruating, I got severe breast tenderness um, to the point where my breasts probably increased a size or two. I was hard, um, it was really hard to jog or walk because they were just so tender. And I got really scared. I thought I was pregnant because the last time that happened to me, yeah. To that extent was, you know, eight years prior, you know, when I was pregnant with my my second child and I started looking up all these things. What do you do when you're pregnant at 40? And I was just so scared. 
And it turns out I got my period. And then the next month, the same thing happened. So then I also started to notice, you know, about a week before my period and going up into my my period, I would start to not be able to sleep very well. So just tossing and turning, you know, throughout the night, having more anxious, manic thoughts. And then once I got my period, all of this would go away. You know, my breasts, the tenderness would go away. The anxiety would go away. And it just seems that there is a spike in symptoms, you know, now leading up, you know, to, to my menses. And also um, definitely putting on more weight, you know, around the midsection and finding it harder to, to keep the weight off. I mean, luckily, I'm a dietitian. So I have my bag of tricks to help with that. But I've definitely noticed that, you know, it's it's becoming harder, you know, to keep the weight off the midsection. Um, I spoke to my gynecologist. I also sought the help with a, a naturopathic doctor and they recommended um, vitamin B. So I take a um, vitamin B um, complex every month, you know, about a week before my period. That seems to really help. And then also I've been taking St. John's wort. And that seems to help those symptoms of anxiety and sleeplessness that I get about a week before. So that's my story and, and just some of the things I'm doing to make it a little bit better. Okay. It's very important to try and find yeah. natural ways to overcome these symptoms. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're a specialist in food sensitivities. What, what's the difference between food sensitivities and food allergies? Okay, so most people are familiar with food allergies. Yeah. Those are the top eight allergens, and they would be dairy, peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, shellfish, fish, eggs, and soy. And those are things that you know right away if you have that type of allergy. Mm -hmm. And I know peanut allergies in particular are very common here in the U.S., and I have a cousin who has a peanut allergy, so she eats something with peanuts in it, you know, for instance, she was in college and there was a chocolate cupcake and it wasn't advertised as chocolate peanut butter and they put peanut butter in the icing. Mm -hmm. They took her away in a stretcher, you know, mm -hmm. in an ambulance mm -hmm. because she went into severe anaphylactic shock. So mm -hmm. those are true allergy responses to foods and most people are more familiar with those. Now, food sensitivities are a little bit more latent, but they also are more prevalent in the population. So by prevalent, I mean food allergies affect um, somewhere between 2 and 8% of the population. And sometimes as we grow older, we outgrow them. Food sensitivities can affect up to 30% of the population um, at some point in, in your life. And food sensitivities are a little bit different because they, you know, one, um, have a large, larger array of foods that can be the culprits. They can be dose dependent. So you might have a sensitivity, for instance, to bananas, but if you have a little bit every day, you're not going to notice it. But once you have, let's say, a day where you have two bananas, you might get sick. Also, um, they... And what kind yeah. of symptoms would that show? And the thing is, with the food sensitivities, the symptoms can be, you know, very varied from individual to individual. So it's very hard to diagnose as a doctor. So with the food allergies, you know, it might be severe GI distress, the anaphylactic shock, but with the food sensitivities, it can range. So it's going to be an immune response in your body. It could be a migraine headache. It could be people suffering from fibromyalgia. It could be eczema. So it can be a lot of different things. It could be um, irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms. So it varies from, from person to person. Hey, does that answer your question, Pauline? It does, yeah. but and could it affect your mental state as well? It can. So a lot of people that have brain fog, maybe um, ADHD, that could be caused by a latent food sensitivity that is undiagnosed. Okay. And um, I'm, I'm always saying to people that I'm, I'm maybe uh, because I'm not educated in this, you know, but I say yeah. that I'm sensitive to um, mushrooms because yeah. I, I love mushrooms and I've been mm -hmm. uh, taking them all, all my life. But uh, recently, I well, in the last few years, I got a lot of these um, candida infections. Yes. And what, yeah. And what I found was that if I ate mushrooms or um, things that with yeast in it, then mm -hmm. very easily I would get a candida infection again. Yeah. 
I that know, would be a food sensitivity. sensitivity. Mm-hmm. Okay, then I've been saying it correctly. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. It's not a true allergy <laughs> because you're not getting that yeah. severe reaction right and, away. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, you have to excuse me because I do have this ADHD, you know, so I jump about a bit. So you mentioned there was like, um, t- I think you said 2 to 8% have food allergies. And what what, mm-hmm. what do you think, what's the percentage of food sensitivities? You might have already said it, but can you Yeah, it, it's up to 30% of the population oh. and not at any one time. So, you know, as a person, you might have a 30% chance of having a food sensitivity at some point in your lifetime. And I think what's interesting about menopause is there's a lot of changes going on in our body, you know, at that time. And you may develop some of these things. Um, So maybe things that you've been able to eat before Mm -hmm. now all of a sudden might bother you. You know, because I think a lot of things are changing, you know, uh-huh. during these years I'll, for women. I'll tell you something yeah. that's happened really strange to me. It's like, you know how when, when I was pregnant, sometimes a certain smell would make me want to vomit. You know? mm-hmm. um, and, and the last year, when I smell, of course, I'm not pregnant, but, you know, I'm menopausal. It's the same kind of hormone chaos. Um, when I smell tomato sauce you know like hot like if you're making like pasta you know just sure. the smell of it and, and and i've loved it all my life but just the smell of it it, it makes me want to vomit i have to run it mm-hmm. i don't actually vomit but i have this nause, nauseous feeling in my stomach and i thought yeah i wonder if that's got to do with changing hormones or, or, or it could what. yeah it could i mean it's hormone related when you're pregnant mm-hmm. and it could be hormone related when you're menopausal you know just like i had some pregnancy symptoms when I got perimenopausal, yeah, you know, yeah. with the breast tenderness, I think a lot of it's related, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If only I could get that feeling with chocolate. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. God, I love yeah. chocolate. <laughs> Actually, um, the 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 speaker we had on a few weeks ago, Glenn, Doctor Glenn, um, he has dis- he has kindly agreed to coach me, and we're going to make a video series. So everybody listening, you can watch and we're going to do it on video so it'll be on youtube so if you check out our website menopausemorph.com i'll put something there where you can see it and he's going to coach me because i'm i'm, I'm like your parents i'm obese you know it's you're lucky that you don't see the the, the bottom part you know i've got a, i'm a cuddly lady i'm a cuddly girl <laughs> you know um but i'm fed up having this pillow under my <laughs> shirt all the time so we're going to uh, he's going to coach me and train me and you know within one year i will be less cuddly but in that sense you know i'll I'll always be cuddly but you know so -hmm. that's a very interesting thing um i'd say i digress i've got adhd no 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 i just remember very good i thought i'm happy to talk about weight loss as well it's another i would uh, i just wanted to let our our listeners know that they could follow that because i want to make it um to do it quite often like every couple of days (laughs) we're got we it'll be part of the pearls of pauline (laughs) (laughs) the pearls of pauline i'm looking forward to to following that Um, okay, what have we got here? I've got I've got a list of questions. It's really great that when people give me questions because then my brain just focuses back on the paper. Because you know? <laughs> sometimes we men are puzzled when we've got a little bit of brain fog and we're going like, "What am I doing? What am I doing? I don't know what to do next." So, so nice. Okay, so we, I think we spoke about this. So how can you identify if you've got a, a food sensitivity? So that would include knowing what the symptoms are. So can you explain exactly. a little bit more about that? Uh-huh. Well, I think, uh, you know, just listening to your body, you know, like you with your yeast infections, I think a lot of people don't listen. And I think a lot of people feel miserable all the time that that becomes their status quo. So I think a lot of people might figure out if they have a food sensitivity, if something's going on with their body, maybe some sort of chronic illness like eczema or chronic pain like fibromyalgia. And you've been to the doctor, the doctor really can't figure it out. Maybe you try different, you know, medications and you still can't figure out what's going on. Sometimes or oftentimes it's going to be your food that's that's making you sick. So that would be a good way of, of finding finding out. But with my company, Food Sensitivity Solutions, we offer a blood work panel called Mediator Release Testing, which actually can help diagnose which foods are making you sick. Okay. Um, 
because prior to, you know, doing these types of blood tests, it's a lot of trial and error. Remember when I talked yeah. about the elimination diet? Um, you know, that diet is is pretty harsh. You can only eat very, very few foods. And, you know, typically it's lamb and rice and lettuce. You know, there's some foods that for a lot of people do not cause sensitivity. So you can go on this diet and eliminate foods. Um, but it's really hard to tell which food is causing what symptom. Yeah. So doing the blood work makes it a little bit easier to, to pinpoint. Okay. So the elimination diet, you would maybe you'd start off only eating six foods, say, all the time. And then you add in one other food and see how your body reacts to that. Exactly. And that's the concept. And then yeah. There's more foods, than six yeah. foods, but yeah. yeah, that's the concept of it, Pauline. Yes. <laughs> and like, they're really, really hard to, to follow. And what if one of the six foods you initially started eating was causing a sensitivity? Exactly. So there's mm-hmm. no way to know because everybody's different. Mm. You know, so a food that's quote unquote safe for most people might still be causing problems for you. You know, I have a colleague who had a patient who apples were were making that patient ill. You know, and apples is something that's healthy for for most people. Most people don't have problems with it, but it could be anything. It could be foods that are seemingly healthy. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, is food sensitivity somehow related to leaky gut? It is. It is. So I'm going to ask you a question. Let's see if you know this. Okay. Okay, what percent of the immune system is housed in the gut? I would guess quite a lot. I would say at least seventy percent. That is dead on, Pauline. Did Yay! you did you know that from something no, before? No, no. Well, probably you maybe somebody told me it in the past and I've forgotten, this? and it's in my brain, you know. But I know that um, because I've read a lot about this uh, because I have fibromyalgia. Um, mm-hmm. When I started menopause more, it was, of course, I wanted to learn about my menopause as well, and I was freaked out about it, and I wanted to share this information with lots of people. So I have been absorbing all the things that people have been talking about on the show, and it's quite amazing that, to me, it's it kind of boils down to eating the right foods, drinking enough water, and getting enough sleep. You know, and mm-hmm. it's, and it's like in modern yep. day society, we are sleep deprived, we are dehydrated, and we eat all sorts of crap. Mm-hmm. And it's like exactly. no wonder we're in exactly. a mess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and sometimes just fixing those things, but sometimes with our lifestyle, it's hard to fix those things and easier uh-huh. to take a pill. So exactly. I think that's and the, do the, you think the though, just of it. Sorry, but with the question. do you think that with the modern day yeah. lifestyle? Food sensitivities have increased, you know, like, oh, is, uh-huh. oh, definitely, definitely. So, I mean, you know, one, we are, we're eating more processed foods. So, you know, obviously, you know, there are things in our food, like food colorings that a lot of people are sensitive to. And I don't know about the food labeling laws in Iceland, but in America, you know, we consume things like FD and C, blue number one and red number three. And these things go into our food. And a lot of these things cause people to have sensitivities. So it's the processed foods. Yeah. You know, I believe okay. that's, uh, that's what, one, of, one of my you know, one of my sons is autistic. Yeah. And, I, and I read a lot about this you know, many years ago when he was a child and they were talking about like the different food colorings can affect, you know, um, autism and ADHD and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now we were talking about yeah. leaky gut yeah. before, right? So leaky gut, um, basically is, um, intestinal hyperpermeability, which means that the gaps in your intestine Um, get a little bit bigger and little molecules of food can kind of cross through that intestinal barrier, right? And that is what could cause food sensitivities for some Okay, is it building up? Is it it creating antibodies towards that? Yeah. Yes. So these foods are getting through those tight junctures. Between the cells. Typically those junctures are very tight. Exactly. Between the cells. And they get leaky, so those junctures get bigger, and proteins or antigens from those foods get through. Now, right behind our gut, like I said, 70% of that immune system is in or around the gut. So, you know, that's going to release 
um, what we call inflammatory chemical mediators, okay? So these antigens leak through the gut. We're going to have your white blood cells are there because a lot of, you know, you know, white blood cells are part of your immune system. A lot of them are, you know, around the gut because 70% of our immune system is around the gut. Those white blood cells are going to release these inflammatory chemical mediators, okay? These things might be prostaglandins and histamines mm-hmm. and leukotrienes, mm-hmm. for instance, Okay. And these are the things that are going to cause those systemic inflammation. So these mediators cause inflammation Mm -hmm. in our body, okay? And that inflammation can manifest itself in many ways depending on the person, whether it's fibromyalgia, Mm -hmm. whether it's migraine headaches, whether it's eczema, whether it's IBS mm-hmm. type symptoms and, and many yeah. more. Brain so I suppose it's like, um, yeah. I think the, out of those things that you mentioned, histamine is the most uh, well-known one, I think. And if we think about it, it's like when we're bitten by a bee or something and we get this red bump, and this mm-hmm. histamine is causing that. And that we go to the pharmacy yeah. and we get antihistamine to take it down. So exactly. If, if we have that exactly. in our gut and it's all inflamed and swollen, it's... It must be mm-hmm. very difficult for the body to cope with that. And of course, so then the body reacts in a strange way and we get all these symptoms. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And histamine is just one. So there are hundreds and hundreds of different chemical mediators that mm-hmm. could be released from the white uh-huh. blood cells causing all this systemic inflammation. So in a sense, it would be like if we're eating foods that we're sensitive to, it's like getting a hundred bee stings inside our gut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I that's yeah. somewhat of an analogy. I yes. like to think of yep. things picturesque, you know, like so, so we can see it in our, our mind yeah. what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Pauline, it's mm-hmm. all a circle. So leaky gut could be caused by systemic yeah. inflammation, mm-hmm. right? Because those cells in our gut mm-hmm. could be inflamed. And as you decrease this systemic inflammation, the leaky gut can heal itself. And sometimes for a lot of people, they can find that those foods that may have been making them sick they can tolerate them again mm-hmm. in the future. I know of two cases of people who had severe irritable bowel syndrome and yes. extreme diarrhea, and it made their life miserable because they couldn't travel mm-hmm. far in the car because mm-hmm. they always had to be near a toilet. And then they changed their diet, not an so extreme form of elimination diet, but somehow they tried to cut out to see what would happen, and it went away. Yeah, and maybe they went to doctors for years and spent tons of money on solutions and these medicines might make them sick. Mm-hmm. I think it was one of the interviews came into my mind and I thought, I have to tell her to try this. And then within about, I think it was two or three months and then it was gone. And she'd had this for years and years and years and went to multiple doctors. Yeah. I mean, you have the celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease where people, you know, get rid of gluten in their diet. A lot of the times they feel better. But then you have a larger percent of the population that's gluten sensitive that might be triggering irritable bowel syndrome. And that might not show up under traditional tests for celiac because they're sensitive to it versus having that celiac disease. Um, But there could be other foods, you know, above and beyond gluten that could be causing these responses as well. Mm -hmm. There are, as far as I believe, six categories of foods that cause sensitivity. Can you tell us about these six categories? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's more Mm -hmm. than six categories, but just like when I talked about the main Uh eight food allergens. Yeah, there's six categories of foods that commonly trigger food sensitivities for a lot of people. And again, you could have sensitivities to foods outside of these categories, but these are often the first places to look, okay? And I can list them for you, but they're dairy, gluten, nightshade vegetables, tyramine-containing foods, soy, and sulfite. Can you explain what those are, the, the nightshades and the other? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say three of them are pretty obvious. I think everybody knows what dairy, gluten, and sulfites are or or soy is, right? But nightshade vegetables, it's a category of plants, a botanical category of plants. And it includes things like potatoes, white potatoes, um, bell peppers, so red peppers, green peppers, hot peppers, eggplants. Um, Those those are a few of the uh, families of plants and nightshades. So paprika, red pepper flakes would also be included in that. Tomotillos, goji berries, okay. which I know a lot of people who go to health food stores eat goji berries. But all of these foods are part of a family called nightshades. And what's interesting is these nightshade um, plants have a 
class of chemicals in them called alkaloids. Okay. And the alkaloid chemicals are kind of a natural protection to the plant. Maybe so bugs don't eat them in the fields, for instance. Okay. So think of it like as a natural bug spray to the plant. I mean, alkaloid chemicals can be very healthy Mm -hmm. for humans because a lot of plant chemicals are very healthy for us. But for some people, people can be sensitive to these chemicals in nightshade plants. Okay. And in sensitive Folks, you know, they can cause a lot of sensitivities and havoc. So it could be diarrhea, glass, bloating, nausea. Um, a lot of people get painful joints or arthritis. I have rheumatoid arthritis and I'm always reading that you shouldn't eat these nightshade plants. I love yes. bell peppers and they, the way they do it in the Eastern Europe, they put it on the barbecue until it's black and then they peel off the skin and it's like smoked mm-hmm. and it's... A roasted and it's smoked pepper. They're delicious. Pauline, have you tried to give up no, nightshades? I, I haven't. Have I you haven't ever done the experiment? It's it's my favorite food. <laughs> I know my mother-in-law suffers from arthritis. She has osteoarthritis, and when she gives these things up, she does feel better. But it's really hard. She has a German background, so she eats mm-hmm, a lot of mm-hmm, potatoes, yeah. which is a nightshade vegetable. So it's very very hard. Now, sweet potatoes yeah. are yams. That's a different botanical family. So that would not be mm-hmm. considered a nightshade. So you can maybe switch to sweet potatoes, you know, as a way to get around potatoes. But that could be something you might want to try. Maybe just a two-week experiment and yeah. see how you feel. We'll do it on our yeah. experiment with Glenn and do the different yeah. things. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because some of your arthritis symptoms could be a food sensitivity. <sighs> giving up chocolate, giving up my red peppers, like what? <laughs> Now, speaking of chocolate, another one of those categories oh, that yes, I course. need to explain a little bit more. Yeah, tyramine-containing uh-huh. foods, okay? So no. you might not know what that is. It's a chemically-sounding it? name. But uh, tyramine, T-Y-R-A-M-I-N-E, okay? And that's actually a compound derived from the amino acid tyrosine, okay? So tyrosine is an amino acid that's naturally found in foods. But when foods break down or they're fermented, this tyramine is going to be formed, okay? Now, tyramine is naturally found in foods that are aged, such as hard cheeses, smoked fish, aged and cured meats, chocolate, beer, sauerkraut, sourdough bread, soy products, and bouillon. And even like kombucha and kimchi Uh uh and some of those foods that are getting popular, you know, all those fermented foods could have higher concentrations of tyramine in them, you know, than other foods. And tyramine is a big one Um, for a lot of people. Tyramine containing foods can trigger migraine headaches. Okay. So when my mother was in her 40s and she started going through menopause, she got really, really bad migraine headaches. And I used to remember she would be locked up in her bedroom, you know, with all the shades drawn for a good day or two. And a family friend said, oh, just give up chocolate and cheese and you'll feel better. And she did. And it worked. So it's just that anecdotal information about food, you know, that works. So food is, is medicine, you know, it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. And that worked for her. So she had a sensitivity to tyramine containing foods. And uh, you were talking earlier about you you were doing some testing in in your company. So are there different options for testing? There are different options for testing for food sensitivities. You know, there's different tests. Um, There's an ALCAT test. There's a Cyrex test. The test that we do that I sell is called MRT or mediated release, mediated release test. Okay, so with this particular test, if you sign up for, you know, the service that I that I have, um, you would get a blood work kit sent to you in the mail. You would get that within a week. You take that kit to your doctor, your local hospital, a phlebotomist, you know, a person who draws blood. You get four vials of blood drawn. You send that back um, overnight to the lab. And again, you know, I'm here in America, so we can really only do this in you know, the continental U.S. and in Canada pretty easy because it does require that you're able to send this, this test back to the, to the lab, which is in Florida, overnight. Okay, so you send this test back. We will look at the blood and see how those white blood cells respond, how many of these chemical mediators are released in response to 
antigens from 150 different food and food chemicals. And you'll actually get a report back that tells you, you know, how much you're responding to these 150 different food and food chemicals. And it's kind of a stoplight report. So for each one of these 150 different substances, you're going to get either a green, a yellow or a red score. So green means go. You're non-reactive to that particular food or chemical. Red means stop. You need to stop consuming that. And then what I do as a dietitian is I put together a what we call a diet that's very calming to your immune system. So rather than an elimination diet where we're just kind of um, guessing which foods to include on that, we are giving you a really specific elimination diet based on your blood work that only includes those foods that are deemed to be green or safe based on this blood work panel. And um, a lot of people get better within a few weeks. So we'll give you maybe 20 to 30 foods to eat, you know, for those weeks. And we'll give you some meal ideas. And I'll give you some ideas on how to appreciate those foods so you get the most bang for your buck. And you eat those 20, 30 foods. Every week we add a few more foods in. And that typically will calm people's immune system. And a lot of people will find that those symptoms of chronic inflammation will go away. Wonderful. And then they can discover the taste of good health. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they can discover the taste of good health. Oh, that's yeah. a really nice yeah. it's, it's, uh, ex, it's, it's information uh-huh. and recipes. We're nearing the end of our time. So is there any last words you would? Oh, yeah. Tell 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 our listeners where where they, where they can find you. And, and do you have anything? Any free sure. giveaways or? I do. I do. So. My website is foodsensitivitysolutions.com. And again, you can put that in your show notes. And I also have a free giveaway. So when we talked about the six main categories of foods that cause food sensitivities for most people, I actually have a report that goes into detail about those and what kind of symptoms they cause. And also at the back of the report is a elimination diet that actually um, eliminates those six categories of foods. So if you're not ready to actually do the blood test, this is a great way to start. It's a great diet. You could try it out for a week or two, see if your symptoms get better. So I can include the link um, you know, to this report and that special el- elimination diet to you, Pauline, so you can give that to your okay, listeners. Wonderful. Yes. Okay, Annette. So thank you very much for coming and educating us on food thank sensitivities. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go down the stairs this and cry great. at my paprika. <laughs> oh, no. Just try it for two weeks. Give it up for two weeks. And again, in my report is all the things listed that you need to to uh, okay. eliminate. I'll, I will Just give try it a try. Out. Starting, starting on Monday, I'm doing this project with, with Dr. Glenn and it's, I'm really excited about it. You know. But yeah. uh, to be honest, I... I <laughs> I'm so naughty. I'm so naughty. I, I I went out and I said, "Oh, from Monday I won't be able to eat this and eat that." And I was eating things, <laughs> ice cream and chocolate. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Kiss the yeah. goodbye. Mm-hmm. Why not have a little uh, have a little affair before you get married? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm a very bad girl. Okay, so let's wrap this up, and we just have to remind our listeners that. We are not giving out medical advice. If you want medical advice, you go to your medical practitioner. And please go to menopausemorph.com and check out our site. And if you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever, can you please go and give us a review? Because we I'm getting lots of emails from people saying, oh, thank you for this and thank you for that. And can you get the speaker? But people are forgetting to give reviews. And for us to, for more people to to hear this, we need more reviews because with iTunes, the more reviews they are, the more they sort of push it out to people. So please, let's support each other, ladies. Let's get the word out there. And if you have something, a particular question you have to do with menopause, with thriving through your menopause, with what to do after your menopause, just contact me at pauline at menopausemorph.com and I will do my best to get whatever special speaker it is that needs to answer your questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Annette, and we'll see you on the next show. Bye. Thanks, Pauline. Thanks for listening to Menopause Morph, your time to change. 
If you've enjoyed the program, be sure to subscribe to the next one and please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help us spread the message about thriving through the menopause. To get a free ebook, more menopausal resources, and to connect with Pauline, please visit www.menopausemorph.com. Thank you.